counter-rotating propellers are one of those things that don't seem to make much sense. In theory, their arrangement is used to greatly increase the efficiency of airplanes. But how does having a propeller pushing air in the opposite direction make you more efficient? Shouldn't the second propeller cancel out the thrust of the first one? Actually, as surprising as it may seem, this configuration incredibly increases efficiency by up to 30%. That's why you'll always see these propellers on planes designed for long distances, like the Tupolev 295. This latter is probably the plane you think of when I tell you about counter-rotating propellers. Believe it or not, it's a pretty old concept, almost as old as aviation itself, which is surprising. Today we will explain what counter-rotating propellers are and how they can increase efficiency by rotating in opposite directions. And why won't we talk about the history of this strange way of propelling airplanes? So get comfortable, I'm Kevin Aguilar and this is Kunz Club. Counter-rotating propellers have a history that dates back to the early 20th century. The first to patent something similar to counter-rotating propellers was Frederick Lancaster in 1906. Initially, it was a concept that was applied only to propel torpedoes and boats. However, its use in aircraft began to gain ground in the 30s and 40s. Among the first examples include the Lockheed P-38 Lightning, whose propellers rotated outward in the opposite direction to the other, mitigating many negative effects such as the P-factor. The P-factor is a fairly simple problem to understand. We know that turboprop planes have the propeller angled upwards, this in relation to the direction of the plane. It is necessary to resist the effects of gravity, but in solving this problem, it creates another. It causes the blade that rises on the right side to generate more thrust than the left blade that is going down, causing an unwanted tendency to the left. Also, another undesirable effect that was always present in airplanes was that, as you had one or two propellers pushing air in one direction, you made the plane tend to go to the other side. Also, another problem is the spiral effect. The propeller pushes air in one direction, which constantly generates turbulence that swirls around the plane and hits the vertical stabilizer, making it even more likely to turn to the left. For example, these problems were present in single-engine planes and were not so serious. An experienced pilot could constantly compensate for this tendency with the rudder, but in twin-engine aircraft, these problems were felt much more. In World War II, scientists solved this problem. They discovered that simply by making one propeller spin in the opposite direction to the other, many of these negative effects were reduced. In this way, the P-factor was completely eliminated, even making the plane more stable. This is how counter-rotating propellers were invented, marking a great advancement in aviation. Now, this worked very well for twin-engine planes, but what about single-engine planes? We only have one engine in them, so this solution doesn't work. Before, in the 30s and 40s, even today in some planes, what they did was simply turn the engine to the right in this way. This balanced out the heightened inclinations. But this solution, although it solved the problems of the P-factor, was somewhat complicated, especially in military aircraft. So, in the middle stages of the conflict, both the Allies and the Axis went much, much further. Experimenting with coaxial counter-rotating propellers, the Germans invented the Dunier Du 335 airplane, which had counter-rotating propellers on the same axis. On the Allied side, we saw examples more similar to what we imagine with counter-rotating propellers, like the British supermarine Safong had coaxial counter-rotating propellers, and it was really good. Also the American Boeing XF-8B or the Curtis XBTC. Unfortunately, most of these first flew when the war was over, just when military interest was more oriented towards jet engines. So the Americans and English would set aside these projects. However, the Soviets would develop the Tupolev Tu-95, one of the most iconic bombers in history. It first flew in 53. And yes, this one had counter-rotating propellers on the same axis. This new propeller design generated many more benefits. Primarily, the counter-rotating propellers generate a much more controlled airflow, re-energizing the airflow produced by the first propeller. Or, put in a simpler way, the second propeller recycled part of the airflow from the first propeller, increasing thrust without making the propeller or engine larger, which in turn increased efficiency and saved fuel by 15%. 
Adding one more propeller generated a more controlled airflow, improving stability and performance, and it eliminated unwanted vibrations. And needless to say, but it eliminated the unwanted P factor and the tendencies to turn one way or the other. So generally, these planes were very stable and comfortable. They felt like driving a Rolls Royce in the air. Remember the last video of the Renault Air Races? It's a sad video. But it's no coincidence that most of the race planes have had them installed as a modification. Counter-rotating propellers make the planes have a little more power and stability, so it was an ideal modification for racing. But if counter-rotating propellers were more efficient, why aren't they everywhere? Why are conventional propellers still predominantly used? Well, it's because counter-rotating propellers on the same axis are not for any airplane. These have quite a few disadvantages as well. They tend to be very noisy, three times noisier than conventional propellers. This makes them unsuitable for a commercial aircraft, being limited to transport or experimental aircraft. Also, you've probably heard it before, but we engineers have a law. The more complex a machine is, the more prone it is to failure. With counter-rotating propellers, you make your plane's mechanics much more complex. You add more gears that can fail, so you're trading efficiency for reliability. This not only makes planes more prone to failure, but it also makes maintenance more expensive. After all, if you make a turboprop plane today, what you want is for it to be simple and cheap. Otherwise, you would make a jet engine plane. So due to these two factors, the noise and complexity, that's why we don't see as many planes of this type as we would like. And in fact, they are even disappearing. If you like this video, you might be interested in knowing why on earth did the stucco have sirens? What's the real reason for this, not the myths? Thanks for watching. See you next time. Bye.